to reflect on just the whole history of our nation. And the, and the reality that, I, I love the line in the plan, one nation under God. I, I express that a little bit to the kids downstairs, but the fact that, you know, certainly we have dual citizenship. We have this flag, the Christian flag over here, to remind us we're citizens of heaven. We're also citizens of these United States. And I, uh, when I said to Ben, when he said, should we do the pledge, I said, yes. And anyone that doesn't want to do it, I think they should move to North Korea for a while until they're ready to, you know. If you don't like it here, get out of here, you know. Um, the, think of the, the turmoil, though. We think that perhaps the anti-American sentiment that we see today is new. It's not. I mean, I remember back in the time of the Vietnam War and all the um, hatred towards our nation and towards those that would defend it. And it was a really crazy time then, and it's really a crazy time now. But, you know, we're the greatest nation on this planet. God has blessed us. And in response to that, you know, in response to our founders who established this nation on biblical principles, we have been a very loving people, a very giving people, and God has blessed us in response to that. We still send missionaries all over the world trying to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the problem we have in America today is that we've turned our backs on what our founders established. And if we could just get back to that, if we could return to those principles that they established we would find the blessing of God. But what we're finding now is, as we say, God, we don't want anything to do with you, and we want to do our own thing. He has pulled back and allowed us to have our own will. And that's why we are suffering, I think, what we suffer. So pray for America. We need to pray for our nation. Pray for our freedoms, uh, especially our religious freedom that's certainly under attack in this day and age. And, as Christians, uh, boy, the liberals hate us and are doing everything they can to undermine the cause of Christ. And which means, what an exciting time to be alive, you know? Because as it gets darker, our light can shine brighter, and we just need to do that. So let's pray. We'll pray for our nation, and then we'll get into Revelation chapter nine, where we are today, and just see what the Lord will say to us from his word. So Lord, we we do pause and just lift our nation up to you. Lord, I, I believe we have many leaders who are ungodly. We have many who don't know you. And so Lord, we pray for a revival among our leadership of our nation. Pray for the salvation of those who, many who think they're all sad. And yet, Lord, you said we would know them by their fruits. And the fruit we see coming out of our leadership is not good fruit. And so we pray, Lord, that you would move first among our leaders and among all of us, Lord, that we would see another great awakening in our nation as people would turn their hearts back to you. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing us with the freedoms that we enjoy. And we do desire, Lord, that you would protect those freedoms. And Lord, uh, we don't want upheaval. We don't... Uh, Lord, we were so disappointed, discouraged, in despair, really, over all the rioting and looting and such that we saw last year, last summer. And Lord, there are those voices who say there will be a resurgence, and we pray that would not be so. We pray, Lord, that there would be peace in our land. Pray, Lord, that you would bless our land. And Lord, now as we look into your word, pray, Lord, that you give us insight and wisdom as we Consider what you would say to us this morning. Bless our time together, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, Revelation chapter 9, last week, uh, we read about the first four trumpets and all the ecological disasters that came with them as God pouring out his wrath on earth. Uh, <coughs> Really, it's a devastating time, and really it's just sad. I mean, God has, you know, he's got the whole world in his hand, he does. But as we push him away, that allows those things that are so difficult to rush in behind it. And so we saw that as his wrath was poured out, a third of the trees and all grass was destroyed. 
was burned out. That would be devastating. A third of the sea creatures and a third of the ships destroyed. I mean, just think of that. The carcasses of all these animals washing up on shore all over the place. That would be a great time, wouldn't it? I don't care if there is beach weather. You don't want to go there. You know, that wouldn't be a good place to be. And then you have a third of the fresh water that became wormwood or polluted. Um, in fact, poisoned is what it is. So that if you drank it, you would die. And then with the fourth trumpet, a third of the light of heaven was darkened. And so we see all these tragic things that occurred or will occur during this time of tribulation. Now the first four seals and these four trumpets, they were judgments directed toward the earth. And we saw with the uh, four seals, the first four seals were those four horsemen that came and they brought tyranny and war and famine and death. That's what the four different horses were. As with these four trumpets, uh, the ecological destruction of vegetation, seas, fresh water, and the sky. So the, the first four both had similarities. Now, the last three seals, they focused on heaven. We had the, the cry of the martyrs. We had cosmic disturbances and the heavenly prelude to the seven trumpets. But these last three trumpets, they all speak of hell. They speak of the demonic, and they speak of horrific things, um, as we will see. You know, verse 1 of chapter 9 says, Then the fifth angel sounded. And I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. So we have a star fallen, and I maintain that this is Satan. Um, it is an angel, according to verse 11. But this star that fell, I mean, what other star has fallen that, other than Satan? He was uh, a magnificent angel, stood in the presence of the Lord, and yet he became prideful. He became self-focused instead of focused on the Lord, worshiping self. And so he fell. He was cast out of heaven. And to earth, that's where he came. But he was given the key to the bottomless pit. He's given this key at this particular time. It isn't like he's always had it. The key belongs to God. And God, in his timing, will give this key to this fallen star. And it's a key to a bottomless pit. Um, in the Greek, it's a buso. It's the abyss. Not a great place. Um... A bottomless pit. Now, what would a bottomless pit be like? You know, and and everybody kind of looks at it this way, like it would be the center of the earth, or it is the center of the earth, which would be very hot. But you think as the earth rotates, you'd be in a state of continuously falling if you were in the center of the earth. Um, and so that's what many people think of or many of the scholars I looked at, what they say is this bottomless pit. And in, well, verse 2, it says, and he opened the bottomless pit. He had the key, God allows him to have the key, and he opens it. And smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace, so the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. And so I was just thinking about this bottomless pit, though. I was thinking, where else in Scripture have we found a pit? And there is that one in number 16. You want to turn there, because it's, it's quite a chapter, really, number 16. Because you have here a challenge to the authority of Moses. And it says in number 16, verse 1, Now Korah, the son of his heart, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and Noel, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation. 
representatives of the congregation, men of renown, and they gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon yourselves. For all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? So you can see here this attack against Moses and the position that God had put him in. You know, we're just as good as you are, Moses. You take a little bit too much on yourself. That was their attitude. Verse 4, so when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. I, I just love that verse. He didn't stand up and say, wait a minute, you guys, you know, or whatever, and attack them. The first thing he does, right to prayer, right on his face. I've been challenged by authority, God. You know I didn't want it anyway. Help me. What do I do here, you know? And so he prayed, and he spoke, verse 5, to Korah and all his company, saying, tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near to him. That one whom he chooses, he will cause to come near him. Do this. Take censers, Korah, and all your company. Put fire in them and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the Holy One. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. So he turns that word back to them. And I'm just doing what God tells me to do. This is what God's saying. Okay, let's do this task. You want to do a task? Let's do a task. Let's see what God decides from this. Verse 8 says, And Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi. Is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to serve them? And that he has brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi, with you. And are you seeking the priesthood also? Therefore you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you complain against him? He's just saying, look, God has already blessed you. Walk in the blessing that God has given you. He's given you responsibility. Do that. Don't seek to do something else that God has not called you to. Do what God has called you to do. And be, just be blessed in that. You know, that's the idea here. And Aaron, I mean, God raised him up. That's what Moses is saying. What are you attacking him for? There's no attack for Aaron. Anyway, verse 12 says that Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliah. But they said, we will not come up. Total rebellion against Moses' authority. <clears throat> is it a small thing? that you have brought us up out of the land, flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, that you should keep acting like a prince over us. See their attitude there. Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. <coughs> then Moses was very angry. So, okay, they've got him angry. They've got him upset. And said to the Lord, do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them, nor have I hurt one of them. And Moses said to Korah, tomorrow you and all your company be present before the Lord. You and they, as well as Aaron, let each take his censer and put incense in it. And each of you bring his censer before the Lord. 250 censers, both you and Aaron, each with his censer. So every man took his censer, put fire in it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle, of the meeting with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. I wonder what those 250 guys thought. See, yeah, see, God showed up. He's with us. He's for us. You know, we're good. We're cool. Verse 20, though, and the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. <laughs> there you go, huh? And then they fell on their faces. That's what we see so much with Moses and Aaron. Right to prayer, right to intercede. Here they are, Moses was angry, and yet here he is the next day as God says, I'm going to just consume them. Now, they didn't have to separate. You know, God is pretty good at shooting at whatever he wants to shoot at and hitting what he's aiming for, you know. He didn't really need to do that. But he's letting them know, this is what I could do. I probably uh, 
should do in this circumstance. I mean, that's what they have earned is to be obliterated. But it allows Moses then instead to intercede, which he does. Verse 22, they fell on their faces and said, O oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry with all the congregation? So the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Then Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they get away from around the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out, and stood at the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, and their little children. And Moses said, By this shall you know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own will. If these men die naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. That's quite a test. That's quite a statement. And verse 31 says, Now it came to pass, as he finished speaking all these words, that the ground split apart under them, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, with their households and all the men, with Korah, with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them, and they perished from among the assembly. And all Israel who were around them fled at their cry, for they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. So there's a pit for you. You know, there is a pit, evidently. And we're talking back here in Revelation 9 about this bottomless pit. I'm glad that God doesn't do that anytime someone is rebellious. Have the earth open up and swallow them. I would be down in the middle of the earth somewhere, I'm sure, by now. But he's making a point. And he made the point, you know, to, to trust, in that case, trust Moses, trust Aaron, and follow and do those things that I've called you to do, and just be obedient and such. But here, as we get to Revelation chapter 9, here's a pit again. This bottomless pit is being opened, and God opening it again. Back in uh, Numbers, the pit swallowed these guys, but here this pit, it releases. Releases these things which are locusts. Verse 3 of Revelation 9 says, Then out of, the, out of the smoke, the smoke that came out of the pit, locusts came upon the earth. And to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth had power. They are commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And so here's these, the locusts, I mean that's what it says, they are locusts, but they're not locusts in the sense that, you know, he said don't harm the grass. Evidently after those disasters we read about last week, the grass starting to grow again. You know, you can burn grass, it grows pretty quick. But, and then we're still, two-thirds of the trees were here, and this shrubbery and such, but these locusts come out, they're not interested in that. They're not interested in food, the normal food of locusts. So it leads some to wonder, just what are these locusts? You know, and, and really, uh, to boil it all down for you to where I come, up, come to, is there's some sort of demonic insect. What else can it be? It's some sort of uh, demonic revelation, I guess, or uh, such. But they come out, and it was given the power of scorpions. And they can sting, you know. Um, harm, it says. But only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Only those ones that God has not protected. Remember the 144,000 back a few chapters ago. That's who they're talking about here. Can't bite those guys. Kind of reminds us of back in Genesis, doesn't it? When, I mean, Exodus, when 
the Israelites are coming out of Egypt. God made a distinction. Yeah, the whole land is going to be filled with flies, but only in Egypt, not in the land of Goshen, though, where the Israelites are. And the distinction he made, he made it a number of times. The cattle that were destroyed, uh, the light or darkness, the light, absence of light. He had three days of darkness. He said it was so dark you could feel it. I don't know what that feels like, but how do you feel darkness? But that's how dark it was. Yet, you get over the land of Goshen, beautiful day, bright and sunny. You know, it's just all this distinction. And then, of course, the major distinction. The last of the plagues that came upon Egypt, the death of the firstborn, did not happen to the Israelites. And here we see God again making a distinction. That's why... Even through this COVID, I was praying that, Lord, make a distinction. Let none of us get sick. We, me and I took it for you. you know, a couple of you had it. But, you know, not to be sick. And God can do that. And I, that's, a, that's a prayer. That's a good prayer. God, you're pouring out your wrath in a sense. Or you're allowing these plagues, these things to come upon people. Separate your people from them. Protect us. I like to pray for protection because I hate trouble. I, I, I'm not so good at it. But. but anyway, God made the distinction on these guys. The seal of God on their foreheads. These locusts, and I, I believe the same way. The devil has limited ability. We give him whatever authority he has in our life because he has no authority over us. No. We're sealed. By the Spirit of God. Verse 5 says, And they were not given authority to kill them. Can't kill them. But to torment them for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. I don't know if anybody's ever been stung by a scorpion. Bee stings bad enough for me. I don't like those. But I've been told, and what I've read, it's the most painful of stings. Getting stung by a scorpion. I don't recommend it. Rarely are they fatal. Almost never. Uh, it's not a deadly thing. And certainly here, whatever these particular locusts with the sting of a scorpion, whatever they are, um, they're limited. Because verse 6 says, In those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. Isn't that an interesting statement? No death for five months. I think about every time I read the Bangor Daily News as a kid, I don't read that thing anymore because it's so liberal, but I used to. And there was always an obituary page and there was always names in there every day. But think of that, five months, nobody dies. The thing that everybody is so afraid of and yet, you know, people don't like to talk about death, at least unbelievers, it seems, and even some believers, just the thought of it. No, don't even go there. I'm kind of content where I am. Leave me alone. Let's not have that discussion. But to think that for five months nobody would die. But you think of how injured some people would be during that time. Or how sick some people might be during that time. And men seeking death. They want to die. I mean, that's not a natural re uh, reality. I mean, sometimes people think that's something they want, but they don't. Wanting to die, seeking it, and they can't. You know, what do you do? Drive into a tree, you know, and your body's all damaged, and you've done enough damage that you should die, but you don't die. You know, what is death anyway? You think about that. How does that happen, you know? How does the spirit of a man leave the body? How does that happen, you know? Because, I mean, we see people that are in comas. People have been in comas for years even. Their spirit is still connected to their body. They have not separated. They have not died, you know. It, we measure with brain waves, um, you know, breathing and heart rate. We can keep that going. So they kind of measure with brain waves. And when you flatline, you know, they, as I understand it, they believe you in that state for a while, even if you flatline, and then take oxygen away and check and see, is there any blip as you're trying to get oxygen that would show that the brain is still active. But if there is none, they just let you go. That kind of, what a horrible thought, isn't it? That idea, but 
The reality is, for us as Christians, the real us, I mean, for people anyway, it isn't this body, this isn't us, this isn't me. You know, we're spirit. We're spiritual. And this body, it, it's something that God has given us as a means to relate one with another. You know, it's a way that we can um, live on earth. Without this body, we, we wouldn't be able to do that. However, our body is not us. You know, Paul, uh, he described the body as a tent. You know, this, this tent. One well, of these days I'm going to take it off. I'm going to get out of it, you know. And, and even scripture talks about how Jesus tented or tabernacled with us. But typically with age or an accident or an injury or some sort of uh, disease or something, our body becomes unable to function correctly. And God releases our spirit to go to be with him, we as Christians. And so death for us as Christians, it's, it's not a bad thing. But the problem is the deception. You know, I was reading in one of the commentaries I looked at how those guys that did those horrific murders at Columbine. They left a, a statement to their parents. They said, life hasn't been very good to us. So we're going to a better place. Intending to go in there and take other people with them, figuring that and then they would die and that they would be in a better place. They would not be in a better place. They were so... In fact, they targeted the Christians in that school. I don't know if that's been broadly broadcast back then or even now that most people know that, but I know there was a number of Christians. They asked them, renounce Christ. And they said, no. And they said, well, then go meet him, as they shot him. You know, what a horrible thing. Horrible, horrible young men that did that crime. And yet they thought as they took their own life at the end of it, that they would be going to a better place. It's not a better place. It's a horrible place. But for us Christians, you know, it's a much better place that we have before us. It is true. But here we have this time where God says he's not going to allow the spirit to be released. And men will seek death, but not find it. They won't die. And you think about that. That's going to be a horrible five months. I look at it this way. It's, it's, you know, it's really a picture to me of hell on earth. Because that's what hell is. Where you'd want love to escape, but there is no escape. There's no release. There's no way out. And there's torment. And they are craving. They would love something else. But they have rejected the only way they can. That way is Jesus Christ. And apart from that... How horrible it would be. You know, what a great gift death is, really. That we don't have to live in this body of sin for eternity. That we can be separated in, from it and get a redeemed body to go with a redeemed soul and spirit and to live with the Lord forever. Heaven's an awesome place. But this, how horrible it is. Desiring to die and death will flee from them. I can't even imagine what that will be. But it's got to be the closest thing to hell on earth. Well, and then, you know, John proceeds here in verse 7, next few verses, try to describe these locusts. I think his language is somewhat limited, but he does the best he can. But he says the shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. This is one ugly horse, though, because on their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates, like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. And they had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And I don't know what kind of picture you get in your head when you see this locust that looks like that, but this one weird looking bug, that's all I can say. You know, I, I can't imagine what this is. Uh, many have tried to say, well, John was seeing, you know, maybe helicopter gunships or, you know, looking at some type of uh, dive bomb or some modern military equipment, you know, maybe drones now that we have or something. 
I think it's best to leave this to be some sort of demonic entity. I, I don't see anything that really matches a description like this. You know, they say because it has a face like a man, because they're looking into the, the, the front of the helicopter and they see a man in there. And, you know, I, I've read a bunch of that stuff, but I think it diminishes it to try to make it some type of modern <coughs> warfare or armament or something. I think it's just one ugly bug that's going to be very devastating to people. Certainly the repetition of the word like indicates it's something John is not familiar with. Um, but he does his best to describe this creature or whatever it is. But really, no idea what he's describing. I'm just glad the church will be raptured. I will be here to deal with those bugs. And even if we were, if because there are many who believe the rapture is mid-trib or post-trib, and not, you know, rather than get into that debate, um, if we were here, we'd be among those protected because we've been sealed by God anyway. So I'm not going to worry about them, but people should worry about them, these things. Well, verse 11 says, and they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek. He has the name Apollyon, or destroyer. They both mean destroyer. And it, it's pretty clear that this king here is Satan. It is the devil. He is the angel of the bottomless pit. And he is one destructive being, isn't he? Think of all the destruction that the devil has caused and will cause in all the annals of human history. What a destructive Verse 12, one woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. There's good news, huh? Well, we won't go into the other two today, but more trouble coming, certainly. Because though, you know, the sixth angel, when he sounds, you know, what happens with that sixth angel? A third of mankind is wiped out. So where there were five months with no death, then you have death like you've never seen before. And what a horrible time. What a horrible place this earth is going to be during that tribulation period. Because we've had disasters. I mean, they happen. In, but in all of human history, to see disaster upon disaster, we don't see that. That hasn't happened. I mean, they come, but... That's what it's going to be like during that seven-year period. Just one disaster after another. And really, it's no wonder men will seek death, thinking they will escape. No, and they won't. Um, but the devastation is so complete. You know, normalcy, normal human life, they won't exist. You know, all the supply lines break down, as we've got just a hint of that in places right now. Um, I don't know if you've driven by a car lot recently, but they, they're not making cars. It's all because they can't get these little chips that they need. A, a car has 100 to 150 computer chips in them, and they're just not manufacturing them. But Ford, I was reading that the other day, Ford is cutting production for like a couple of months. They're losing billions of dollars in the auto industry. And Katie, you mentioned meat may be a problem down the line. I remember you saying that. You know, that's, that's just, it's not that there isn't enough. It isn't a supply, and it isn't a demand, because I still have that demand going on, but, you know, it's, it's just the processing. It's, it's people. It's, it's, it's this uh, response to COVID. But imagine the devastation. If this disease could cause what it caused, imagine these disaster upon disaster, what that will be like. It's no wonder that Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 22, that unless those days were shortened, no flesh would so true. And I'm still astounded. You know, we get to the end of chapter 9. Again, verse 20, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works. You know, we'll talk more about that last week. But that's just astounding to me. When you have disaster upon disaster and trial and trouble, wouldn't you think people would turn to God, but no, they turn from Him. They, they The pride and the the desire to do everything according to their own will, their own strength, causes men to reject God. 
But God in his mercy, and again, all of this, through this time, is God being merciful. God trying to reach out to men, saying, look, the direction you're headed is horrible, it's terrible. Turn, repent, seek Jesus, and you will be saved, you'll be spared, you'll be protected. I'm so grateful that Jesus came. So grateful that he went to the cross to pay the price for my sin and for your sin. Dead, buried, and rose again the third day. And we're going to remember that now with communion. So brothers, if you come, John, maybe you give us a hand too. Let's uh, just remember the Lord in communion. <coughs> Lord, we remember your broken body on the cross, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that <coughs> by your wounds we are healed. And we remember you now, Lord, according to Acts 2.42, that you may continue steadfast in the apostles' doctrine of breaking bread, fellowship, and prayer, Lord. How could we sin against our God who hung on the cross for our sins? We remember you now, Lord, by partaking in communion and remembering you by your by this bread and your broken body, in Jesus' name. Amen. His body broken for us. So we don't have to go through all that stuff we were Praise the Lord. Let's read it. Shedding of blood is no remission of sin, but his blood was shed, and our 
sins are remitted. Praise be to God. Yes, we are. Let's all stand. Uh, I do want to mention one thing as you stand. I do have an application for baptisms. So if any of you are interested in being baptized, grab one of those. I'll take them up back with me. But we're going to sing uh, Bless Be the Time and then we'll pull this in prayer. And I'll go up there with you. Yeah.